Good afternoon. I'm Greg Niemeyer. I'm a professor for art practice at uh, UC Berkeley and a director of data and democracy here at Citrus, a new initiative to look at how we can uh, leverage the data we have about the world we live in to make a more just and equitable society. Today it's my honor to introduce uh, David Baldocchi, uh, uh, sorry, Dennis Baldocchi, who is uh, going to give uh, the talk today. And before I do so, I would like to make a few comments. I'd like to welcome the web viewers who are joining us online. I also would like to say that there's a final I for Energy talk this week on Friday uh, by Joel Cubby. And uh, I want to mention that uh, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, April 26, we have a conference called Swinging and Flowing, which is about inclusion and new media. Ask the question of who is actually included in new media apps and uh, who has access to them and who has access to making them, who is owning the tools of new media production. And uh, I have a very important message which is please compost. All the uh, plastic clamshells there are actually compostable and the leftovers of the food that you have are also compostable. So please do that because we have to save the planet here. Uh, Dennis Baldocchi is definitely on that team, and I have uh, a few things in common with uh, uh, Professor Baldocchi. One is that we both use sensors to measure things, and uh, we, we have a little bit of a history using a, a product called Lycor sensors, and uh, uh, so I immediately connected with you on that level. Uh, those beautiful tools that are made to yeah. measure um, uh, various aspects of our environment very, very accurately, and very precisely as well. Okay. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Baldocchi is often quoted for having predicted that there will be less winter chills in the Central Valley, which means that our cherries will not prosper very well, uh, and uh, we will soon have no more food left. Uh, that come, uh, and so enjoy your uh, salad while you have it there. Uh, uh, this may be a changing, a changing treat. And uh, of course, this kind of information gets a lot of attention, but it's really just the peak of a much broader uh, body of work. Uh, Dr. Baldocchi has uh, been a professor here since 1998, a professor of biometrology, and he has a PhD in bioenvironmental engineering from the University of, uh, where was it? Nebraska. Nebraska, that's right. It says University of here, but it doesn't say Nebraska. <laughs> it didn't make it on this paper. Oh, well. Um, so so what, I, what I find really compelling intellectually about um, Dr. Baldocchi's work is that he's uh, understood how to uh, articulate the dynamics of changes, not only in terms of, um, in terms of uh, absolute levels, but in terms of uh, how closely we need to observe dynamics in order to truly understand them. So for example, there's a temporal aspect of his work that ranges from second through, seconds through hours, days, seasons, and years. So literally, um, he's looking at how we can um, articulate better models about the future by looking at um, changes in the environment every second and uh, looking at them uh, changing every second across years. And there's enormous amounts of data that, that paint a very particular and precise picture of the complex dynamics we're arranged in, uh, we're, we're involved in. The spatial scale of his work ranges from the dimension of a leaf, a single leaf, through the depth of a plant, canopy, and all the way to the planetary boundary layer and the horizontal extent of landscapes. So there's a temporal and a physical spatial um, scale that is very dynamically uh, analyzed at very uh, different levels to produce ideas of uh, what kinds of challenges we might face in the future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dennis Baldocchi. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I've always really relished an opportunity to interact with the engineers on, on campus because I think there's a lot of potential interactions and, and areas to profit in terms of making environmental measurements. Uh, as biometeorologists, we want to study what we call the breathing of the biosphere, and with the engineering technology on campus, you guys are developing the next generation of sensors, sensor networks, computer um, data acquisition systems, et, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, as you all know, sitting here being part of Citrus, there's a strong history here on campus of developing small networks that you can be distributed across landscapes, rooms, buildings, starting with the smart dust ideas of a few years ago where you can have literally hundreds if not thousands of small sensors that are all talking to one another. Really gives us a new, unique ability to measure the distinct, unique aspects of a microclimate. And a lot of this is worked through wireless networks, essentially. They're all talking to each other. There's central nodes, and they all phone home the information to a central database, essentially. The one question I kind of pondered when I was asked to talk here is that there still has been a disconnect between the biometeorology world, who's really interested in studying 
microclimates, whether it's in vegetation, across landscapes, even in urban environments, and the smart sensors, the uh, wireless network. And part of it, I might say, it kind of gets back to maybe how the history of our fields evolved. Uh, the idea of studying climates is very, very classic. Uh, Rudolf Geiger is really the leader of this, and he started making these measurements in the 20s and the 30s. And a lot of this information is codified in these textbooks. So the talk today is going to kind of follow a bunch of challenges and objectives that try to refine how our communities can work together and move science forward to do interesting things. Obviously, it's on vogue to study the environmental state variables. They're cheap. They're easy to replicate. There are many of them. But we have to be careful. We don't want to measure the state of the sensor. We want the sensor to measure the state of its local environment. So we really have to think a lot about good and representative exposure to the sensors. And we can't forget calibration. Uh, my mantra in my lab to my students is calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. This said, then really measuring the state variables of the environment, temperature, humidity, wind, really should not be a, a means to an end. Instead, we want to understand the mechanisms, the biophysical mechanisms that cause these state variables to change, to change with time. That really brings us to the idea of fluxes, flux densities. Number of moles per meter squared per second, or the number of joules in terms of energy per meter squared per second. And I'm not sure if it's on the consciousness of, often of the um, community to really think of fluxes as opposed to measuring state variables. So that would really be a major thrust of today's talk. Um, and I'll try to show you ways that our communities can work together with two different types of methods that are used to measure fluxes. Uh, one's called the eddy covariance technique, and the other one is the old tried and true flux gradient method. Now let's first think about putting sensors out in the atmosphere. Um, I, walk, I always park in West Circle, and I walk past the uh, West Circle uh, kiosk, and the last couple of days I noticed a new weather station. It's nice, it's up, it's being reported to campus, but I started looking at it. And all weather stations aren't created equal. Uh, the good thing about this weather station is that the temperature sensor is in this device here. This is a shielded, aspirated housing for temperature and humidity. This is great. You really want to be able to shield and aspirate your, your temperature sensors. But that requires power because you need fans to blow. My big concern is the anemometers for wind velocity and wind direction. This is the rain gauge. The rain gauge is going to shed eddies that will disrupt the wind field. So in some respects here, the wind velocity measurements are going to be biased. Also on top of here is probably a LICOR quantum sensor to measure sunlight. Well, this is a small clearing around the tallest grove of eucalypt trees in North America. And most of the time, this is shaded by the local trees. So any sunlight you may get to try to make policy on campus for solar loading is going to be biased, essentially. And also the wind gauge, or rain gauge, is very, very high. High winds, logarithmic wind speed. There's a lot of chance that wind, rain will just blow out and not even go into the sensor. So the point I'm trying to make is representativeness and sensor siding is really, really critical as we develop these networks. Now, I also want to make a case of why fluxes are so important. Over the course of a day, we can measure the time rate of change of things like humidity and temperature. And you'll see they may go from a low value at night, rapid increase in the morning, and then follow off in the afternoon. This is because we really can treat the atmosphere as a bathtub. And we're putting heat and energy into the bathtub. So in essence, Temperature and humidity are changing with time because of the flux density of water vapor through latent heat exchange and heat through sensible heat. The more and more heat you put into the atmosphere, the deeper and deeper the planetary boundary layer will grow, and it will actually cause these time rates of change to flatten off and dilute. On the other hand, when you have a very shallow boundary layer in the morning, you can have a very rapid change in your state variables. So the bottom line is, if we want to understand the temporal dynamics of state variables, we really need to understand the biophysical controls of fluxes of energy and mass occurring at the interface between the land and the atmosphere. So I hope this makes the point clear of why we are so interested in fluxes, per se. 
engineers out here like equations, so I thought I'd throw a nice equation, and this essentially represents what we're talking about. The time rate of change of some scalar concentration in the mixed layer, like CO2, will be a function of the surface flux of CO2 divided by the height of the mixing layer, and then this growth of this mixing layer and this entrainment of air above the mixing layer. So essentially, the fluxes in many respects are two-directional two two, two from the bottom and from the top. So if we're going to try to take the next step and move from using wireless technology to measure state variables, can we use it to start assessing fluxes? If so, and what are some of the constraints? So I've asked, first question I asked myself and asked the audience is, is wireless technology ready for flux gradient measurements? And I think yes. I, I think it's not infeasible. The only point is we have to realize that the atmosphere is very well mixed and the gradients we're trying to resolve are very, very, very tiny, essentially. And we also have to be cognizant of micrometeorological theory to apply the flux gradient method correctly. So the flux gradient method, essentially, uh, we, with this one example here of a trace gas, it's just going to be a function of the vertical gradient of mole density of CO2, for example. At maybe a level here and a level there. And it's going to be multiplied by an eddy diffusivity. That's I have units of meters squared per second. So obviously the wireless technology can do a very fine job of maybe measuring these gradients of trace gas, moisture, wind, and temperature. <coughs> the biggest question to apply this equation is to try to assess this exchange coefficient. Now, we have to also remember that doing this, the K-theory is an inferential estimate of a flux. It is using a model, so it's not a direct measurement. We have to apply this only in what's called a constant flux layer. So this means we have to have a long extended fetch of similar vegetation or land surface characteristics so the atmosphere can adjust to the properties of the surface, essentially. And we should make the assumption that the atmospheric conditions are what's called steady state. They're, they're steady with, with time, essentially. This said, we can try to estimate these exchange coefficients simply using momentum transfer theory. And if we know something about the wind velocity profiles, we can get a first estimate of k. We can make the radiant measurements directly. We can come up with all of the first guess of what the fluxes may be with caveats, essentially. And I want to stress this because often when I s review papers trying to measure microclimates, I often see a sin where people will put one sensor above the vegetation and a whole bunch inside the vegetation. These measurements are essentially useless because the atmosphere is a um, system with complex shear that causes K-theory to break within the vicinity next to the canopy because of non-local transport. So if you have multiple layers or multiple layers of measurements, do them a few levels above the canopy and dispense with maybe inside or at least have three or four measurements above the canopy and several inside. But don't ha just have one point. The other thing I learned is that these gradients can be very, very small. And if you're using thermocouples, for example, the resolution of thermocouples wired in um, differential mode is much, much better than individually, independently. So we can actually resolve gradients on the order of a 80th of a, a degree Celsius per millivolt, for example. So again, thinking about how you wire and, and implement the sensors is quite, quite critical in this type of work. The state of the art that our field is working with today now it really is using the eddy covariance method. Uh, essentially, it's a direct measurement where we measure instantaneous fluctuations of vertical velocity. We're watching the air move up every second, every tenth of a second, up and down. And we're measuring fluctuations in the mixing ratio of the scalars within that. We make these measurements for a half hour to an hour, average things out, and we essentially have a first order direct measurement of the breathing of the biosphere. So it's direct, it's in situ, it's quasi-continuous, unless the instruments break. It's integrative of a big area. So if I have a set of sensors here, I can essentially measure the integrated breathing of all of you sitting here eating your lunch and either sleeping or paying attention. And the nice thing is, compared with alternative methods of measuring fluxes, like placing chambers over the surface, it doesn't distort and change the local environment. It doesn't touch it. It's very remote. It's, it's really a wonderful method that we all love. 
So the key point is if you uh, apply this in a, a network sense, you have to be cognizant that the flux density we measure is essentially representative of a co-spectrum of eddies, ranging from very, very slow eddies that might be on the order of 0 0.0001 seconds per second up to the very fast eddies that may be occurring 10 times per second. So your instrument system, your data system has to be able to sample the whole continuum of the spectrum. But once it does, we can get good fluxes. So ultimately, a challenge for designing a wireless system that can ingest eddy covariance data is that we need to sample up to 10, 20 times per second. Hopefully, we want to do it day by day, et cetera. So this leads us to have data storage requirements between 10 and 30 megabytes per day. Um, when I first got in this game, this was a big problem. Uh, our disks were 256K. My technician just put a couple terabyte drive in my lab. So I don't think it's a problem now, essentially. Uh, we do have to have boots on the ground and calibrate. We have to process the data. Um, and I think it's, it's feasible, to be honest with you. Um, so yes, is the wireless network ready for any covariance? I think with fast enough sensors, and there's a whole revolution of new trace gas sensors coming out, possibly yes, especially LICOR. LICOR is really famous for developing these open path sensors that don't require pumps, that require lots of energy to move air through a closed cell. Um, the other components that go into a flux system, a three-dimensional sonic anemometer, have low power requirements as do the, um, the data loggers. So this is our setup we have right now in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. We're measuring methane. So this is our trusty LIGHTCORE methane sensor. This is our methane, I'm sorry, this is our CO2 water vapor sensor, our aspirated temperature humidity sensor, our three-dimensional sonic anemometer, data boxes, all run on a solar panel. We're pulling less than 24 watts. 2 amps at 12 volt DC. So these systems have been engineered in such a wonderful way that they really are low power requirements. The calibrations are rock steady. We calibrate monthly, and they, they really change, essentially. So I, I'm really excited about the advances that have occurred in engineering sciences with trace gas measurements over the, the past decade. And we can go many places. Uh, our, historically, we've made measurements over soybeans and alfalfa, wheat, corn, and rice peatlands, grasslands, boreal forests, savannas, deciduous forests. Um, the biggest question is if you go taller vegetation, you may need a tall tower to mount your sensors, essentially. Uh, if you want people walking up, you may want a scaffold tower. If you just want something small, maybe a, a small telescopic tower you can put your, your sensors on. So it's not impossible to do this. And the beauty is we get so much information. Uh, this is just a time series of one year of carbon dioxide fluxes over a grassland in California. Uh, this is zero. At night, we lose carbon, so it's a plus sign. During the day, the plants are green, vegetating, photosynthesizing. They're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. You can see the day-to-day -day swings. You can see the increased growth. Uh, right now, it would be peak in the grasslands, lots of water. Things are growing to their full extent. They take up all the water from the soil, they die, they respire, we get some rain events, the microbes turn on, big pulses. So we can see new types of breathing of the biosphere we could never see before uh, by not having continuous flux measurements. And this will really help us understand the change of concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, for example, this event here. CO2 concentrations in the well-mixed atmosphere were about 390 parts per million. After that rain pulse, they jumped up to about 450 parts per million. Well, what happened? The whole landscape got wet. There was less sensible heat exchange. So the depth of the boundary, boundary layer was very shallow compared to normal conditions. So you have a small bathtub. And we changed our flux rates from the order of one unit to about 15 to 20 units. So we put this huge amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the concentrations increased. If we only measured concentrations, we wouldn't have known why. By measuring fluxes in concert with concentrations, we know now the mechanisms. And it brought in a whole complex set of boundary layer dynamics, microbial ecology, decomposition, and rain pulsing, hydro, hydro meteorology. 
where I really see a lot of potential of collaboration between our communities is studying what we call the flux footprint. If I have a tower here, yes, I'm measuring an integrated flux upwind of me, but there's actually a probability distribution of what material's coming from where. And it essentially follows this probability distribution out, tailing out so far. So you can see most of the material may come 200 meters away, and we get progressively less and less material out to a, a kilometer, for example. And to be honest with you, we see absolutely nothing at my feet. All that stuff's on below right away before you get to the, the sensor. Now, the problem we face in a force is that we have a tower here, and we have no way to study the footprint very well. Where I see wireless networks playing a critical role is to be able to set up a whole set of sensors measuring soil temperature, soil moisture, plant temperature, light, all within the footprint. So now we have a better spatial representative measure of what the fluxes really are seeing. Classic example, um, these were our data we took in the peatlands in the uh, Central Valley, measuring methane. During the day, we saw this footprint here. It was a drain pasture. There wasn't a lot of methane coming out, and we measured small fluxes. At night, we saw huge fluxes occurring at our site. We didn't understand why. Well, with hindsight of looking at the flux footprint and images of the landscape, we find that the footprint expands very large at night under a stable boundary layer, and now we're recovering all these wet spots, these flooded areas. Those are known sources of high methane production. So again, having a wireless network of maybe soil moisture sensors, methane sensors, uh, even extra flux systems, we could really get a better sense of the spatial patterns of complex landscapes like this. The other bet noir of micromet community is that often our colleagues don't, what we do say, called close the energy balance. The idea is that we can measure the net radiation balance at a landscape, measuring the incoming and outgoing sunlight and the incoming and outgoing solar long wave radiation. And that should equal the summation of energy convected from the system in terms of latent and sensible heat flux and storage in the soils. Most of our colleagues, when they do this, might only account for 70 to 80 percent of the energy. Now, we worry about this a lot, but I have to admit the physicists that I know studying the cosmology, I think, only get about 5% of the energy. So I, I think we're doing better, but we need to do much better than this. And so the idea is that if we could have representative measurements of spatial measurements of soil heat flux, for example, we can make vast improvements of our ability to close the surface energy balance. Because I think what's happened in the past is some colleagues have decided to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, we don't close energy balance, then our eddy covariance measurements are, are bad. And I argue contrary is that we're not measuring the other storage terms well enough to make that conclusion. So we could, we could test that, that hypothesis. So at this stage, there's actually now a global network of colleagues making flux measurements globally. Uh, this is uh, associated with a project called FluxNet that's associated with some national networks called Ameriflux. Uh, there's a project in Brazil, across Europe, Asia, Africa. And we're all working together, sharing data through the data archive here at um, Lawrence Berkeley as a way of looking at data in a network sense. Now, from these experiences, I also wanted to communicate some recommendations. Um, it's not good enough just to put a bunch of sensors out and collect measurements. We really need to take those measurements and turn those into data, turn that data into information, and then digest that information and put it into knowledge. This really takes people. It, it takes a lot of people. It takes technicians, students, even scientists and postdocs going out in the field, regularly checking the instruments, making sure they're working. I mean, right now, I'll be honest with you, we have a problem with our soil temperature sensors. We think we have a ground loop, and we get these weird oscillations that are occurring. Uh, by going out in the field, we see it, and we can try to correct it. Once we have that data, we really need to have a database. It, it's not good enough just to make the measurements. You've got to do something with the data. And sharing it, processing it, archiving it, and being able to query these complex data sets are really, really important. And so it also needs to build a scientific community so you can work together and share. And I think this has been really the beauty of the, the FluxNet uh, project. And by having networks, we're able to span much wider sets of climate, 
ecological conditions than we could by just studying a soybean crop by itself. Uh, this is just an example from our, our studies. Uh, this is just annual carbon exchange uh, through photosynthesis versus respiration. A few of my sites might be here. Working across the globe, we can now see a strong relationship between photosynthesis and respiration. And this has some major implications about biofuels. There's a lot of arguments to increase photosynthesis, grow more plants, take up carbon and burn it in cars. But this is also showing is that there's a large cost in respiration with higher photosynthesis. There's no free lunch. So we can learn a lot just through networks of, of flux towers. So now I'm going to kind of change directions and kind of go more specific in some of the measurements that we make that we use to interpret our fluxes, essentially. First, I want to start with temperature. It's easy to measure, right? It's been around since the days of Celsius and Fahrenheit, right? That's where those names come from. If we want to try to measure temperature and apply it for flux gradient theory, uh, these are some theoretical, theoretical calculations of temperature gradients above and within a forest. And we can use micromet theory to say that the gradients will be a function of the flux and friction velocity, the uh, momentum transfer to the surface. Well, if we're over a short canopy, three meters, and we have a typical heat flux of 100 watts, the gradient's small. It's 0.23 degrees Celsius per meter, essentially. That's way within the half a degree error of an independent sensor working by itself. Okay. If we're over a tall forest, the gradients are even tinier. In fact, this is why flux gradient theory in some respects was dismissed and replaced by eddy covariance because the gradients over a tall forest are three hundredths of a degree Celsius. So these metrics are really important if you're trying to design your system and know what the limits should be to distinguish between zero and real measurements essentially. The other point gets back to what you're measuring. It's really, really important to aspirate and shield the sensor. Otherwise, you're just measuring the temperature of the sensor. And so I've had my students over the years take some thermometers in the lab, have some unaspirated, some aspirated, and compare them. You can see some hysteresis. You can see the slope is about 0.93, so about 7% error. Um, at 20 degrees, there's a bias of over a half a degree, 0.6 just by how the sensor is deployed, essentially. Now, the, the key point is if we want to measure hundreds of sensors and air temperature, we're going to need hundreds of aspirators, which require batteries and power. So I guess a good challenge for the engineering community is can you guys develop us small, tiny, intense power sources so we can actually make good environmental measurements in a distributed sense? I, I think that would be really exciting. Often we're, often, often, we're also interested in measuring sunlight. Well, it's a, quite a complex challenge to measure sunlight under vegetation. How many of you walk through the woods, like to go walk through the woods? You guys like to go hiking? Well, as you walk through the woods, you'll notice there'll be sun flecks, and there'll be shade spots, and there'll be more sun flecks, and more shade flecks. So if you take a walk through a forest here, you'll see spots of full sun. But they'll be punctuated by shade, partial shade, more shade, partial full sun. So it's a very, very complex light environment. So this complexity, this heterogeneity, puts major constraints on how many sensors can be out in the field. A classic paper by Bill Reisnyder back in the 70s showed that if you have a light environment that has 150% coefficient of variance, that's the standard deviation divided by the mean, and remember, deep in the canopy, huge variance, low mean, you may need over 600 measurements to get within 10% of the population. This is a perfect test and application for wireless sensors, networks of sensors. Um, if you're trying to come up with daily averages or a more uniform environment, maybe three or four sensors are needed. So the light environment is a classic case to do uh, wireless networks. The other alternative is to develop some sort of engineering system. Uh, in my lab, we've been using what we call these um, tram systems. Essentially, we have a railroad track here. We have a data logger and a sensor on a, a system with a motor. 
and it just goes back and forth, back and forth. It docks here, hooked up to solar panels. Batteries get recharged because we have some solar panels in the sun, and then it turns on again. So essentially, the data you see here can be generated by a system like this. It's nice, but look at the complexity of a real force. This is all we're measuring. You know, we've really improved by using one sensor, minimizing calibration of hundreds of sensors, but it's still a pretty fine, thin line to represent the whole force. So there is a lot of promise to have, again, wireless networks to measure light environment. Remember, light drives all the currency of an ecosystem, photosynthesis, energy exchange. So we really spend a lot of effort on light. But we do have to be careful. Most of the sensors that are used in this environment tend to be quantum sensors by companies like um, Lycor. Well, the problem is if you place a sensor underneath a vegetation, there'll be selective filtering of the light spectrum, essentially. A pyranometer is agnostic. A pyranometer measures the energy through a thermopile. But a quantum sensor just measures the displacement of uh, electrons through a uh, silicon system. And so there will be some selective air by applying a quantum sensor under vegetation as opposed to above the vegetation. So be careful if you're making this application, essentially. And th these are data I collected for this talk, I just went to the eucalypt forest on campus, took a quantum sensor, looked at its spectrum in the sun, walked under the trees, measured it again. In this case, the air may not be super great, maybe 5%, 10%, but you know, how good is good enough is a question we always have to ask ourselves. The other cool thing we can do and start multiplying is using light emitting diodes. This is another technology my lab has been doing. Um, so essentially, you all know that LEDs, probably somewhere here, you give it electricity, it sends off light of a known color, right? Berkeley is one of the first cities to actually have red LED stoplights. Why heat up an infrared light and waste all that energy if we can just have red lights and green lights? Well, if you take an LED and give it light energy, it will also produce a small EMF, electromotive force, that you can measure. And the cool thing is then it's very selective of its wavelength. So we're actually developing LED sensors that need very little power that can measure reflected lights of different colors from the landscape that we can use now to tell us about the function and structure of, of ecosystems. Uh, in fact, we had a student working with us last summer. She was from um, uh, Irvine, uh, Mirabel Jaquez. She just got accepted to the graduate school here at Berkeley, so she'll be around. And she was great. She learned so much. She learned about troubleshooting uh, circuits. She learned how to calibrate. She learned how to take data, to analyze it, and write a very nice report. So it was really fun working with her. But this is the prototype. So essentially, you can see we have two red LEDs, two near-infrared LEDs. They're tiny. They're small. We put them out in the field. And the cool thing is now we can relate things like normalized difference vegetation indices with things like fluxes. Because in reality, it may be difficult to set up an eddy flux system over various uh, plots that are looking at biofuel methods, for example, thinking about the energy biosphere uh, initiative. You know, switchgrass, uh, miscanthus, different fertilization, irrigation issues. We want to know the carbon fluxes. But if we can calibrate LED reflection spectra with fluxes, we might be able to infer these. And we can have hundreds of them. We can put them all over the place. So there's a lot of promise, again, to blend flux information from biometeorology with engineering technology. And then digital cameras. Uh, we're using digital cameras to look at the amount of leaf area that's above the land surface. And we can use that to study what's called the phenology, the changing in, of the, the expansion and contraction of leaves. Uh, right now, we're just using cheap cameras, uh, Canon cameras for 100 bucks. But I bet some of you out there are using and designing small CCD systems that are probably cheap that you could actually replicate and put them all over the forest. Our problem here, we only have three or four of these. And this is what we see. It's nice, but we don't see a great representative vision of the canopy. You know, if we could have hundreds of these things, we could put them all through the flux footprint and deduce information on the heterogeneity of, of vegetation. The power of doing continuous measurements is seen here. We can see leafless period. All of a sudden, the leaves come out. Rapid change in light attenuation. Gradual change over the season. 
drop off, plus year-to-year -year differences. So there's a lot of power and potential to develop systems like this, deploy them, and operate them for years, essentially, and have databases to share the data. I'm going to wind down now with a few sections talking about the soils. Uh, we want to go into CO2 first. And again, there's been a new revolution of sensors. Uh, companies like Visola now are creating CO2 sensors on this little probe. You, know, you and I talked about the um, LICOR system. You know, the LICOR system essentially has a, a tube this big. It sends an infrared beam across air in a tube, and there's a detector, and it says how much light's been absorbed due to Beer's Law, essentially. Well, they've miniaturized this now on a few, on about a centimeter scale. And now you can deploy these probes in the soil. And what's cool about the soil now, we can actually measure continuously soil respiration. But it's back to my earlier point about calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. Manufacturers will sell you anything and say their sensor is the best in the world and it's perfect. Well, they're pretty good, but these are one, two, three, four, five sensors doing the same thing. We calibrate them against the same gases and there's differences. Okay. If we want to measure gradients, we have to factor out those calibration biases. Small differences that are biased can alter the interpretation of our flux. So calibration is really critical. But once you do it, you know what you have. And then from that, we could actually measure then now gradients in the soil. And using flux gradient theory, we can calculate the fluxes. And with these sensors, now we can see a whole new set of dynamics. In this case here, we put sensors under a tree next to the roots and at some grassland away from the trees. The trees are active. They're putting all that carbon into the roots. It's exuding out in the soil. We're seeing huge respiration rates. The annual grasses here, they die. They're not doing much. We just see tiny background. Rain event occurs. Microbes turn on. We get these big pulses that decay as the soil is dry. So again, fluxes are giving us whole new ways of looking at the metabolism of, of ecosystems, essentially. And to see the seasonal dynamics as biological activity is, is active as it decays with the drying of the system compared to other, other treatments, for example. Finally, we need to also study moisture. And moisture is a real challenge because the sensors are expensive and they're hard to deploy. So there's a lot of potential, this is a nice paper on this topic, advocating the use of wireless networks to look at soil moisture. We can now put sensors all through a, a woodland, for example. And we're collaborating with people from Arizona doing this uh, in two ways. Uh, Trenton Francis is using now a, a method called uh, electromagnetic induction technique with this little cart that we can go back and forth through the soil and actually map soil moisture. But this needs to be validated. If you, if you superimpose this image and sensor with a wireless network of soil moisture, we can get a better sense of how well we're measuring soil moisture. So I think I can draw to a conclusion here. And the main points I try to make in today's talk is that fluxes are really important to diagnose the state of the atmosphere. State variants don't infer fluxes well. They're only proxies. If we set up our sensors, we want to make sure we're measuring the state of the environment and not the state of the sensor. We need to calibrate, calibrate, calibrate. Uh, there's many new challenges facing us into the future that we can deploy these things well into space and understand our flux, flux footprints. I think there's a lot of opportunities to look at new sensors like LEDs, digital cameras, developing new power sources. And there's obviously this new revolution in trace gas sensors, essentially, that are, that are out there that I think make the idea of measuring fluxes feasible uh, for both of our communities. So I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Or um, Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hi, Dennis. Hey, Thank you very much for the talk. Who's here? Uh, I'm curious about your uh, thoughts on how to provide, and this is actually 
aimed at the whole audience, uh, ways of providing measures of uh, air density for use in precise, accurate estimates of trace gas mixing ratio using spectroscopy. Uh, there are satellite sensors that are trying to use different bands to estimate the air density. And I look forward to something that could do that for uh, in situ measurements. Well, I mean, there's cheaper and cheaper CO2 sensors that are kind of on a computer board now. So I guess a lot of it gets back to price and, and resolution and accuracy. Um, you know, the light core sensors we use are all $15,000, and I think these new CO2 sensors on our board might be $1,000 or so. So again, I think the engineering field is developing with new materials, new sensors, better sensors. Um, we still need to push air through it, so it still needs pumps. So I think the reality is still is power and having adequate power to deploy these things in a way that we can trust the data. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Is your work focused exclusively on measuring um, existing scenarios, or do you use some of the data to make models about what would happen if you change certain factors of the environment? We use a lot of this to create models, essentially. Right, so right. we kind of go back and forth. In fact, the models help us design our experiments as much as the measurements help us parameterize and validate our models. So we, we try to do this as a, a scientist and, and have that back and forth, essentially. And so when you deploy these sensors, do you have uh, agreements with farmers that they know what's going on and do you give them the data again? Ah, How does that's that good work question. out socially? Well, our Savannah work actually is on a ranch by Russell Tonzi. He's uh, 99 years old. Um, we've been working on his ranch for almost 11 years. In his case, we pay him $1,000 a year for rent. And it's a huge oak savanna. Uh, across the way, we're working with Fran Vrira. He's a, another rancher. He was superintendent of the uh, Jackson School System, and he's worked with the Ag Experiment Station for a long time, so he just lets us go free. Uh, in the Delta, we're doing rice work, and that's on land owned by the Department of Water Resources. But the idea there is, can we grow rice to stop uh, soil subsidence and loss of peatlands, and can I give the farmers some economic reasons as opposed to just growing wetlands and tulings again? So these are some of the questions we're asking that have a practical management aspect. Again, using flux data. So that's yeah, so lots of fun. So I have a great team. I have Joe Farfrelli, my technician, that's been doing a great job over the years. I have great students and postdocs. So uh, it's definitely a team, especially more as I stuck teaching here. But you know, I'm, I'm collecting data right now as I'm talking to you. Or we're collecting data as I'm talking to you. That's the cool thing. So. Do you have any more questions? No. Okay, with that, I wanted to thank you. Again. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.